Jake Herbert, one of my favorite, favorite people to talk to. How are you today, sir? Fantastic, Ryan. Man. How about you? Things are great. Been a long time since we synced up over a podcast, but uh, I was re-listening to some of the early ones we've done, and let's get right on into it, my friend. How's life? Life is great. I can't complain, man. Podcast is flourishing, working on a, a documentary right now. Um, I'm really loving that, and business is good, too. Business is busy. Good for you, man. I love seeing your goals, the way that you have it broken down. You're someone that sends them to me and then periodically I step back in and just say, hey, how's it going with this? Which is great. And it's been awesome watching you go from what you originally sent me two years ago to where that's transitioned into. I mean, you, you're doing these documentaries with Gable, with Tannenbaum and the matches with everything you're doing. I know you're involved in a couple other uh, podcasts and that whatnot too. I don't want to release it in case you're not talking about who you're working with any of that stuff that's for you to brag and share no, i'm working on with the spartan one I, i've announced it yeah so the spartan yeah. combat guys yeah they're yeah. awesome awesome so that's that's fantastic man good on your end well i appreciate uh you know the conversation we first had was on was probably almost three years ago and it's been so long and man that just a lot of the things we talked about i still use like the four b's we're going to talk about them today i write them every single morning to this day still Body being balanced business, man. God, dude. Such a good way to organize your day. Let's, yeah. uh, let's start with fasting, though, man. I've been watching you. You're a fasting machine. How did all this start for you? <laughs> Health-wise, right? Um, I, don't, I don't have the – I'm not getting ready to wrestle in the national championships anymore. I, 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 much like much, I think, wrestlers and athletes, once we're done competing, we kind of – you watch wrestlers, they either go two ways. They either get super skinny – uh, or they blow up and they're just like, they look like they ate versions of themselves, right? Like they, they get fat and huge and out of shape. So and it's because you don't have that anything to keep you in shape or train for anymore. It's tough. So um, yeah, I've been fasting for health benefits, but also because you, purposeful suffering, right? You got to make life a little challenging every now and then. I don't have the nationals. I don't have a reason. It's just a reason to say, hey, uh, I'm now, I, I can't have that glass of wine this week with my wife. Because it's so easy to just have that glass of wine or have that beer and you fall into that drift, right? You start to drift slightly off course. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, one glass of, what is it? Like one glass of wine every night is 300 calories times 360 calories, right? There's your mathematicians, 90,000 <laughs> or 900,000 additional calories, whatever the hell it is. And that's a lot of weight. So. Um, yeah, I fast for health, health benefits and just to, 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 to make sure I mentally can do it. So um, I love it because it gets to use my coaching. I get to put accountability in place and uh, I get some other people to kind of cut some stuff out and do it with me. So it was fun. So when you do it, you go, it looks like minimum 24 hours. What's the one you just did? How long was it? So I did a five day water fast only, Ooh. right? So Sunday night, uh, I ate my last meal at around eight o'clock. And I didn't have another meal until Friday, probably around five thirty, six o'clock, depending on when we got in. <laughs> oh man, that is, that's a long time. I mean, I saw you post how, you know, back when you were cutting weight, the real thing was the lack of water. So the fact that you could drink water helps, but dude, come on five days. So that are you, at what point are you hurting a little bit in there? Day four. Right. So that's the things that I wanted to look into too, is what's the health benefits, right? I've read articles and studies and things that like, Hey, we have this intermittent fasting thing, which is going along. So it's pretty good every now and then to go a 12 or 19 or 20 hour window period of time without food. 72 hours apparently is what's resetting your immune system. So that's what I really wanted to hit and do. Mm. Uh, but I just threw it at five days because why not, right? Why not go a little harder? I don't know if I'll do it before. I, again, I still had great energy, but I also didn't set it up very, very well. Like I ate really bad going into my fast because I had my son's birthday party. So I think I had like maybe like pizza and pasta that day, which I don't normally eat carbs. So that sucked one. Uh, two, I eased out of it and in, into the right manner. But I didn't work out until Thursday of my fast. So that's day four. I worked out in the morning pretty hard. And then Friday, I actually did two workouts. I did jujitsu in the morning, Friday morning. And then I did um, a yoga class before my fast. So I didn't work out the rest of the week too, which is kind of like inverse. And the other way, I'd probably wanted to work out earlier in the week and eat better going into it. Uh, but I, I had a good group of people that joined me, uh, about four or five people that, that did it with me. Uh, I don't think all of them did the full five days, but I mean, again, right, like taking a day or two off, it's, it's not a bad thing to kind of reset, break a habit and uh, remind you that life isn't always uh, sunshine and rainbows. 
it feels good to know that once you make it past that first day, you're really not anywhere as near as hungry as you think you are. No, not even close. And it's easy to do. Like anybody could do it. Anybody can survive five days without food. You just got to be put in a situation where it's not possible, right? You get locked into a jail cell. Nobody see, feeds you for five days, but you have a, you know, a, a jug of water or water supply. You're fine. Like mm -hmm. you can do it. It's just like, Hey, do you want to do it? And are you willing to put the things in place to make you get it done? Like I would have never completed that fast if I didn't have the accountability set up. I had $2,000 on the line. So, um, and, and what I did was it, it, again, I have a coach and I gave her, wrote her a check uh, out say, Hey, if I take a bite of food, you're going to cash this thousand dollar check. And then I made it publicly, right? I announced it on Facebook and said, Hey, anybody that comments on my, my post, uh, if I break my fast, that thousand dollars will be split between anybody that commented on there. So uh, it, it just that holds that accountability. Now it's super easy. One Wednesday night, I'm starving and, and I'm hungry, and my son's sitting there with a little piece of like shrimp. And he's trying to put it in my mouth. I'm like, uh uh, like, that bite of shrimp's not worth two thousand dollars, right? So that, that's that, and that's that's how you kind of get yourself to force to do do anything, right? Um, you, you, you want to stop drinking or well, great. You put enough accountability in line. You can stop drinking. You want to get into shape and work out. You put accountability in line. You can do it. This, this is what I do as a coach. So I, I love helping people do this, putting that accountability in place so that people can then uh, like basically force themselves to succeed and do the things that they don't want to do, but they know they should do. Mm -hmm. Now, when it gets back to that, this thing that you're huge on is habits versus goals or even standards versus goals. I read the article that you had sent me a long time ago on the habits versus goals. And there was something in there that said a habit is an algorithm that's running in the background all the time. And, you know, they could be good or bad habits. Everyone knows that back when you were in peak animal mode, 2012 Olympic team trials training, what were some of your non-negotiable daily habits? Oh, it, it was, well, drinking, right? I didn't drink alcohol while training or getting ready for events, right? Why, why the heck would I? So that was a non-negotiable, right? I worked out, I hit my training plan daily, right? Depending on where I was, we had an off day, we had an off day plan once a month, but I'm making all my lifts, I'm making it to wrestling practice. Those are non-negotiables. Um, stretching, that was a big thing, or physical therapy, whatever it is that my body needed uh, to get it done. Sleep, that was a non-negotiable. So it's like all the health habits, right? Diet, sleep, and exercise. And that's, the, that's what I call the trinity of health, right? Uh, if, if you look at a healthy person, they have their diet in line. Uh, and I don't care what it is, right? They have a diet or something that they're following, rather it's vegetarian, paleo, intermittent fasting, right? One meal a day, protein, produce. Who cares what your diet is? As long as you're, you have some plan that you're doing. Um, sleep, right? You're getting the, the six to eight hours of sleep that is needed every single night. And then exercise, right? You're, you're getting that heart rate up and working out. And if you get those three things in line, and in plans, uh, it's, it's kind of impossible not to be healthy. I mean, that cures 99% of almost any health issue that you could have. The sleep is a huge one. Super underrated too. How are you managing that as a new parent? I am not. That's the hard <laughs> part. That is, what it's, that is what it's throwing everything off right now is I am not managing my sleep. I'm not getting it well. And it's hard to do it, right? As a, we have an eight month old who crap shoot right every other night she's up at like three to five screaming um and i have a 2.2 year old who at this point still gets out of his bed and climbs into our bed so anytime he was in there at 11 40 last night so those are the battles that we're looking to win is sleep training the eight month old and getting the two-year-old to sleep in his bed all night long so we're on like month like four of this right now and it's gotten better but it is still very, very tough to have your sleep disrupted and then still get up at 5 a.m. and do the workout, right? So that's why I put those accountabilities in plans. Like the workouts I don't miss are the ones I set up to do with my friends or I have people coming over because then I can't miss it. Mm -hmm. It's those individual runs in the morning that, hey, I'm supposed to get up at five and run before I head into the office uh, or work out before my kids get up. Uh, and the baby was up and Mikey was in, I didn't get good sleep. And I just decided, hey, you know what? I need that extra hour of sleep versus that exercise. And then I don't get it. The funny thing is that a lot of, a lo I mean, now people would say maybe you're healthier to get that extra hour of sleep and not run, which sounds crazy. It does. I, it just depends on where you're at, right? Like sleep and ex like, you can't make, you don't make up missed sleep. Just like you don't make up like missed exercise. You just get back on the horse or do more of it. So it just, when it comes to making a choice, you got to make that choice. So um, 
but that's where we're getting to. So I'm getting a better control on it. I'm working out probably consistently about three plus times a week right now. Uh, and still, I had to kind of reshift my framework of what I considered a workout as well. That was another hard part going from Olympic uh, peak wrestling shape to, you know, I, I just want to look good in my clothes and look good naked. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Now, one of my favorite things about you having kids, and I know you had a, a daughter before, but I didn't know you then, but having young kids now is watching all the crazy stuff you do with your kids on Instagram. Like you're stretching with them when they don't even know they're stretching, or you would have Mikey have them pull your fingers. And most recently the rings, it's crazy to watch them swing around in the ring. So tell me about kind of how you think about parenting and instilling like a level of physical fitness in there when they don't even know it. Yeah, they don't. Right. And, and so kids, kids, again, I wish that they would always do what you tell them to. They don't, especially at two and eight months, but they're going to imitate you a lot of what you do. So uh, a great example of imitation is with our son, Michael, right? He's two. So he has anger issues and he'll tell you, he'll go, something will happen. He wants a waffle. We say, no, he goes, I'm mad. <laughs> Crosses his arms like that. And he'll go, I'm mad and pull it up and, and do that. And it's just like, man, where does he get that from? And when he gets mad, we go, all right, buddy, well, you know, let's take a deep breath and calm down. So we'll do that for him. And then it'll be fast forward an hour later. He's not listening. Like, Michael, you're not listening. You put your, your, you're not listening. Hey, Michael, dad's getting mad because you're not listening. And then he looks at me and goes, so I don't know if that's like him just, hey, I hear mad and to breathe and get control of your breath first. Or he's telling me, hey, you're getting mad, calm down. <laughs> Right, which probably is the case. It's probably a combo of both. But but back to the physical training, yeah, he, he's going to see it and uh, do it. So we have rings in our backyard. And my son is, he was two in June, which April, May, June. Yep. So he was two in June, possibly might be July, if I forget. I'm sorry, one of those months was his birthday. Um, so he um, has probably, what, maybe 10 hours of hanging on rings like this, right? Uh, before he'll turn three, he'll get at least 50 hours of ring hanging time. And it's fun for him because he runs out in the backyard and we have it gated off and he runs in and he grabs the rings. And now he loves jumping from one, like we put like a little chair and another little chair and he like swings on him and tries to ring back and he's just holding himself up. He's playing, right? Yeah. It's fun for him. But if you think about it, right, you ask the average adult listening to this, like, like, Ryan, do you have, do you have access or do you have like gymnastic rings around you? Right now, I, I actually do because I have a pull-up bar in the back. But so you have the gymnastic rings. Most people do not, right? So if I go and I ask people in my office here, they don't have it. So it's like, well, and how much? How many pull-ups does the average person do in a year? They have like zero time of like pull-up hang time, like ever. So and you can't get better at that, right? That just goes down to the law of success equation, which is just uh, you want to get good at something, put time on task, right? Time on task over time equals you're gonna have to get better at something. Uh, so, so it's the same thing, my physical fitness and my athletic development, he just watches this, right? We bring him into the rooms. We have him watch it on TV. Like if he's going to watch YouTube, uh, before I watch YouTube kids, I make him watch this. I just type in people are awesome children's edition. And you just see all these kids doing all these amazing things. And so he's constantly watching it and then he's going and doing it. And then we're implementing like holding it on the rings and he's like grabbing things. And I'm always trying to let him hold till he falls on all certain things. So I, I, I love that. I'm not worried about my kids having any um, physical limitations at all by the time they're 10. And those rings are so cheap. They're like 30, 40 bucks to get a set, yeah. you yes. know, exactly. man, I love how you're parenting your son. And it reminds me a lot of how someone we both know, Joe Decina would probably think about it. You know, yeah. he's such a, he's such a maniac in the best possible way. You and Andy, um, you're, business partners i guess in a sense through the base wrestling program what is base and how did that start so base is essentially um it's it's general they call it in russia general prepared readiness all base is it's a physical literacy uh, system right so that children just like we have we go to school to achieve you know literacy so we can read we can write we can think um there are courses that help set up with financial literacy Right? You can study the path of money. You can understand how a balance sheet works. What is cash flow? What's net versus gross? Uh, and then you have physical literacy, being able to control your body. So when I look at that, I'm like, hey, if I can have somebody that can have literacy, read, write, and think, uh, and then achieve financial literacy and physical literacy, 
you can do whatever the heck you want in this world. So mm-hmm. that's kind of been my own personal journey um, was to achieve, you know, as close as I could to physical literacy. And I've been really, really diving in afterwards to financial literacy to really kind of nip that one in the butt and, you know, master money instead of let money master me. Um, but I, I love, uh, I, I love studying. That's where base comes from is we basically went to Russia and learned their general prepared readiness. Right. There's a reason why, and again, this is not the knock on Kyle Schneider. I love Kyle Schneider. Fantastic. Russell. Awesome. The guy, I don't think he can do a back bridge and kick over from a back bridge to a front bridge. Mm. Uh, the reason why I say I don't think he can, because if he could, he wouldn't get pinned. Right. Those two times he got pinned. It's a bad situation, but you don't have a good bridge. Uh, and, and again, I love Kyle and I was talking about it and obviously you don't need to do a back bridge, a br- back bridge kick over to win a world title or an Olympic title or be one of the best wrestlers in the world. But every single kid in Russia learns that right before they're even able general prepared readiness to compete in Russia. They have that thing. So when we took that, we kind of learned exactly what that Russian training system is of general prepared readiness because it can be learned. And I'm not saying, hey, just because you can do a back bridge or not do a back bridge, it's going to make you a better wrestler, but it's not going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. right? It's not going to hurt you at all. It's going to only prepare you better because guess what? Now when I'm trying to scramble with like Mark Perry and those things, that was the only reason why I could get out of Mark Perry's legs is how good my bridge kicks were. And here's the secret to bridge kicks. Either you've attempted 10 of them or you haven't. You've either attempted 100 of them or you haven't, right? And if you haven't, you're not going to be able to do it. Same thing as a cartwheel, right? It's And it kind of relates back. I remember being in Michigan with like a youth wrestling coach and he was sitting there and his son was a really good wrestler no physical literacy at all, mm. right? Like just like had a typical mentality of this is the way things are, this is the way they are always well. And he was really good and never reached that level of great, right? Of national tight, of national champ or world champ or any of that stuff. So, but he was sitting there saying, I've been teaching these kids stand-ups all year and, and, and we have 30 kids in our, our class and none of them could do a stand-up, none of them can do a stand-up. So I was like, all right, well, let's think about this. My daughter is eight months old. If you grab her hands, She's crawling around on her belly. She will pull one knee up, pull another knee up, and stand up. Didn't have to teach her that. It's, it's a move. So I took those 30 kids, and I said, guys, do me a favor. Stand on a line. Uh, do backward rolls down the mat. Two. Two of those little kids could do a backwards roll up to their feet. Mm. How the heck are they going to stand up with another kid on top of them trying to hold down? Even if they know the technique <laughs> perfectly. Seriously. Such a good and point. I thought that would make some like leeway in this kid and this thing. Oh, wow, this could be cool. But like the co- I was like, do you guys ever practice backward rolls? And of course, the coach, yeah, we do it all the time. Well, if you do it all the time, how come only two kids can do it? You don't do it all the time. You lied to my face. You don't want to do this. You don't want to learn. See you. I'm probably never going to talk to you again. Right. You know, and that's it, it just that's just the way it is. And it stinks. And I can't tell you how many like wrestling rooms are out there like that. But physical literacy is now something that I want to take and I want to use wrestling that I think should be a big component of it. Because if you literally want your kid to be physically literate, you got to find some sort of freak or specialist like myself or Andy um, or, or some strength coach like that. that'll get that. Or you put them into gymnastics. Yes. The negative side about gymnastics is it has that negative condensation of being a girl sport and mm-hmm. for girls. Uh, so most kids tend to avoid that, but why can't wrestling be that gymnastics for the kid? Cause if you just have a wrestling mat and you have this general prepared readiness for school or community, and you know, it's going to increase the football team, it's going to help you in football, soccer, baseball, whatever. Well, now when it's cold outside, you need a wrestling room for these facilities to be in. And if you always have a mat room, you can always have a wrestling team. So right. that's kind of like the theory in and behind it and why we created it and how we helped it. And now it's just a matter of are, are enough people going to adapt it or not adapt it. It makes so much sense though when you think of you know, just a general level of fitness. You know, I don't know if there's certain tests you guys do, push-ups, pull-ups, whatever it is, but it's like the, the example you told me a couple of years ago about how could, how could you do a stand-up if you can't even stand up when the kid's on you anyway? You don't have that muscular build, yeah. you know? It just makes total sense. Um, and so when you were in Russia, it just seemed like every kid – had gone through that before they even got to the wrestling technique. Absolutely. And that's, that's what it is. You look at their practice like the, as a youth wrestling practice, a third of it was based on this general prepared readiness. Like we call it ninja training, mm. right? Where like most of the practice is based on that. So they can have the physical ability to hit a back bridge, right? To throw somebody. I think it goes back to the five essential skills where one of them is like a bridge, right? Or b- being able to stand and go feet to back into a back bridge and kick over. That's a big thing. Cause you can't throw somebody in Greco 
for five unless you can hit that that, that back arch, right, mm -hmm. or that back step. So it's 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 just a lost art that was there. It kind of really annoyed me seeing that, and I wanted to make a big change of it. So we went and created this system, and now it's it's changing. And the programs that are implementing it, and the people that are doing it, it's it's out there, right? You're seeing these these guys. Look at the the Cuban um, Manuel Lopez, right? The guy can do standing backflip, 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 backflip. Who the heck's gonna beat that guy? Right? Dude, and a monster that can move like that. What right? about that Inchimendia kid who just got to Ohio State? He can do. You could do those backflips and crazy shit like that. Yep. Gable, like Gabe Stevenson, right? You're looking at this new era of people and that's something that can be developed. It's just, it's just time. Mm -hmm. And you teach it to them at a young age, right? They don't know any different, right? So there's a story that's out there of uh, the elephant and the steak, right? You hear that, like you take a, a baby elephant, you put the little collar around their neck or their leg and you put a little steak into the ground. And because they're little, they can't pull it out. They can't pull it out. They can't pull it out. And they become conditioned. To learn that so then when you see this huge massive elephant with this tiny little rope and a stake well he just eventually quits trying to pull it out and realizes i can't pull it out and doesn't even attempt to do it mm. even though with one little rip he ripped that out so it's the same exact thing right when you learn to do a bridge kick or a front flip or a handspring or walk on your hands at seven eight nine ten eleven twelve whatever it is as long as you continue doing it right you're always going to be able to do it even at this point i can jump down do bridge kick bridge spins do a back handspring catch myself walk myself with my hands forward backwards every every direction because i have so much time on it now i don't do it on a daily level anymore but i can still do it because it's just been so ingrained into who I am and it helps me with jujitsu. It helps me stay healthy. It makes me look cool in front of kids, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's, it, and it's a lot of fun teaching them, right? And then learning is learning. So now when they can learn something physically, there's no difference between that, that, that relates and transits to the classroom, uh, to the wrestling mat, to whatever it is they're going to do, right? Uh, them teaching themselves or learning how they learn that learning process. So that's, that's what we do with it. And we kind of, the base wrestling system breaks it all down to, hi, I'm, I'm very new and I can't even walk and chew gum at the same time to uh, here I am at the level of, you know, like completely like athleticism. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, it's like, even if my, I don't have kids, but if I do, even if they don't wrestle, they're going to do general prepared readiness just for life. And I think elementary schools should be doing it. I mean, we're a little bit sick in the head, but you know, I think it's a no brainer. And I'll send you this link that was called uh, exercise in the brain. And it literally like breaks down, like I guess in Argentina, they extended all the school day by one hour um, just so the kids could have one hour of physical play and exercise. And that what that relates to physical play and exercise, it related to every kid's test score, like going up in that city. Uh, because there's a huge thing about it, right? If you think about it, there's an argument of like what the brain is actually said to do. And this is straight from the video. So like what the brain is said to do, it's like, well, the brain is sitting there and it's, it's, it's there to learn how to do complex movements. Me talking, me moving my hands. That's why my brain exists so that I can move, feed myself and continue that brain to give life. So that makes sense that why exercise is such a big part of it. And they say that like, hey, if, there were, if they could create a diet pill of to have the effects of what exercise does, it would be the best selling <laughs> drug in the history of the world. Like yeah. you wanna talk about, you'll get better sleep, your testosterone's gonna go up, you're gonna feel better, you're gonna look better, you're endorphin. Like it literally does only good things for you and benefits, like unlimited amount. It's like the limitless pill, but people refuse to not exercise. They think it has to be, oh, I gotta go, uh, you know, hand fight Brett Metcalf or Terry Brands <laughs> for an hour to get exercise. No, you just gotta get your heart rate elevated for an extended period of time. That's literally all exercise really is. And it can start with it, right? You can be the 600 pound guy who with Richard Simmons started clapping and then worked his way down to 200 pounds, right? And you can go, or you can go crazy like David Goggins, went, right? When he went from that 380 <laughs> pounds down to the guy now just runs, you know, with broken legs and does freaking, you know, hundred and plus hour courses. So, when like you would know because you push yourself to, th I mean, you're known to throw up once a week in college, but I don't think most people even realize um, how far the body can go. Is that story about you throwing up in college once a week true? How, how else do you know you, you went that hard, right? I knew that if I pushed myself so hard that I puked, like one, when was the last time I did that? Well, 2016, right? I have literally not since then exercised so hard since I puked because I didn't have something I was training for. But how else could I possibly know I went so hard to my body had a reaction to go, hey, you, it, you're just going to be <laughs> injury or you're going to throw up, right? Um, so I think that was like, the one of the tipping points of that was um 
yeah, I, I would I would go that hard to I puke because then how else would I know where my limit is, right? How else would I run? Kyle Day talks about that. Like every day in your mind, you run down to a wall and you push that wall back. And then you run to that wall and you push it back. And then you run a little farther next and you keep running that wall and pushing it back. I'm at the point where I push that damn wall so far back. I'm not even going to be able to, like, I think I can maybe run enough to maybe see the wall. I'm never going to go back and be able to touch that wall again. Oh, and not never. I just, that's a limiting belief that apparently I just put on myself. Yeah. Right? Because it's not my focus anymore right now. So you're an animal, Jake Herbert. <laughs> you're an animal. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, we've talked about it before, but never on this show is uh, your visualization when you're doing an airdyne workout to lose weight or when you're warming up before a match, it's enough to make anyone want to just go attack a workout. Could you share kind of how you used to build yourself up before you, for a big match? Yeah. So again, self-talk is everything, right? And everybody talks to themselves, right? Your brain is a computer. You get to program it or you get to choose to let somebody else program it. Um, so I'm sending you no problem. an exercise video right now so that you have it. Boom. Why exercise is so underrated. So now you have that in your text. Appreciate um, it. But yeah, so when you talk about self-talk, it's, it's, it's programming. Everything does start with the mind right? It's mindset. It's, it's this mind over matter. There's just so, so much of it is up here mental. So when I talk about that self-talk, it's just the series of my habit building of the questions and things that I tell myself to get ready for a match. Uh, it's the same exact thing. And it's nothing different than what everybody else did. It's just who's reminding them, themselves of that over and over and over and over again. Right? So when I'm sitting there and I'm getting ready right before I match, I have my routine. I do my stretch. I do my workout and my warm up. Great. I am uh, two matches out, one match out. Great. Now it's one match out. It's time to start to flip that switch, right? Because I don't want to flip that switch the night before because by the time I get there, I'm like, oh, my energy is now drained. So it's like, great. I'm ready to flip that switch. So I start telling myself, all right, there's two minutes left before I go out there, right? And I start thinking to myself, right? it was like six minutes out. I start the match before and I start ramping it up, right? All right. How hard did you work for this? Right? How much did that hurt? How many times did you puke? How much blood did you get through? How many surgeries have you had? What did you miss? What did you give up? right? This is my, like, I, I'm going to win this match. I'm training to win this national title. Now this guy's out here against me. He's trying to take my national title. He didn't work that hard. I know for a fact that he didn't go and make himself, push himself to puke every single time. I know they didn't sacrifice everything that he did. I know he wasn't willing to get to that end and get so tired and then go another go. I know he wasn't sitting there having three people like shark bait him. I know he wasn't able to sacrifice this or do this or do this. I just keep telling myself what that is over and over and over again of how hard I've worked, how much I committed, how much this is mine. And start visualizing and seeing myself going out there and attacking and killing and attacking and killing. And you just get yourself ramped up, ready to go. So that when I'm ready to slap hands that line, I'm ready to go. And then you got to be able to then shut it down afterwards and go back to that, right? Because you can't, you can't live, you can't, maybe you can live like that. But for me, that's, that's not how I want to live my life. I want to be able to turn that switch on to ramp up and go and then turn it off and be done and just save that for the next time. But you would take it as a personal insult though, that the guy yeah. stepping out there was coming after you and your family. That's how far you would take it. Yes. He He's trying to take money <laughs> off my family. He's trying to take money away from me. I, I, I don't, great. I, yeah, I get second place. It's not the same payoff. Right. Right. It's not the same exact thing. It is personal. Right. It's a hundred percent. And and again, it's, it's war out there, right? We're doing the match. I'm doing everything in my power to end him, to stop him from attempting to take me down, to impose my will mentally and to physically dominate and break him. And I want to make it so bad that he never wants to step out there on the mat with me again. Yeah. And then you would take it so far as that to think that your coach would have to give you like a sedative, like a stab a needle in your back to freaking calm you down. Ref wasn't going to stop me. I'm going to keep <laughs> the I'm out there to do. Dude, yeah. I love it, man. Now you mentioned, uh, you know, two thousand. You, you mentioned the guy who gets second. You know, gets paid less. You got second in '09 at the Worlds, coming right out of college. Before that, silver medal. Did you ever think you'd go on and wrestle in 2012? That's a great question. I don't know at that because I know I took the Olympic year and I was going hard for '08. I didn't know if I'd do it at that level. I was still kind of like up in the air of what I wanted to do after college. Uh, because again, I took all this time and energy and went to a great college like Northwestern University. And, um, you know, I, I, had so, I was going to have such great opportunities to go work and get a job. And it kind of solidified that, that after 09 and, and making that world team, because I was pretty close to just going in and getting shoulder surgery after my senior year. And I was like, well, Rather than go and get the shoulder surgery because it would still bother me a little bit, I was like, the nationals, the NCAAs just happened and the U.S. nationals are like a month after. 
I'm already in good shape. I might as well just keep training through and get it done. And I answered it and I was like, well, at that point, I don't think I ever placed at the nationals before. And I went and won it. I was like, okay, great. Now that puts me in the finals of world team trials. So might as well keep training and great. Make the world team. I go, okay, great. Might as well go to this world championship and try my best. And I go to the world championship and great silver medal second in the world. Well, I got to train through 2012 because when else would I ever get this opportunity to do it? But before then, no, I wasn't really focused. Like, and in, in everything up to 07 was like, how do I win a college national title? Mm-hmm. How do I become an NCAA champ? That was 2005, that was 2006, that was 2007. Uh, and that was, again, 2008 was how is it going to help me? I'm going to take an Olympic redshirt year because that's going to help me win another college national title. I'm going to go and train with the best in the world and see all this. And I was kind of like, well, this is pretty fun. I get to hang out. I get to train. I really liked it. And I th- so I think in 08 is when I was like, I would definitely do another Olympic cycle because this is a great lifestyle. I enjoyed traveling across the world to Russia, to training in different places, to seeing the world, to hanging out with friends, to having that, that downtime. And then when they're like, hey, you literally get to do exactly what it is that you love to do, minus the schoolwork. I was like, Where'd, and, and you're going to get paid for it. I'm like, sign me up. Done. Yeah. Done deal. Yeah. And if you wouldn't have done that, we would, we would have never got to see you wrestle Kale, who I understand Kale was one of your mentors, not a mentor, but someone you aspired to be like. Yes. Is that right? Well, he, well, look it up, right? Exactly. He was my weight class. He was at my thing, undefeated college wrestler. Yeah, I mean, I watched him at 03, you know, win that silver medal, watch him win the Olympics in 04. I think it was 2002 he won his silver. Um, but like, yeah, watch him growing up competing. And that what I think would be is like the one downside of our system. Mm. Right. Cause I would say for that, what, for a five or six year period from nine through, you know, up until 16, when I relinquish holds, I was probably the most dominant 84 kilo wrestler out there only to lose the Cal in 11. Uh, and then to lose to Jaden Cox in 16. Mm-hmm. Right. But between those periods, like that was mine, like this $20,000, 195 pound tournament that's happening right now. Like, man, that was 20, 40, 56. That was like $120,000 I would have made because nobody else was beating me in the nation. <laughs> I was smashing everybody. Like I was it. I'm, I'm not the best college wrestler and I'm the best, you know, uh, U.S. net. And I proved it year in and year out uh, at that weight class. So the downside is I've spent more time competing against Kel on that mat than I did training with him. Mm. So I literally maybe have one or two practices, maybe four practices in my life actually working with Kel. So if I, no, no regrets in what I did. I love the position I was in and what I did and what I had. But if I could go back, it would make sense to spend more time with one of the top guys like that because how much better could I have been? And that's the question I asked myself. Is that why Barner got his gold and had a lot more success? Because Barner was there training with him all the time versus I, I didn't have him. I had other resources, right? And I had other people, which, which got me to a great level. But I, I don't like how that's, that, that's set up in our system. Right. I think that's a flaw that will happen. And that's why I'm excited. Like somebody like Kyle Schneider made that opportunity and that jump to yeah. go and get that in. Cause right. Maybe he was thinking the same thing. This is one of the best guys. You got Sanderson there, Sanderson there, David Taylor's there. It's got a whole thing. Maybe that's why he made that move from Ohio state over because how much better could he be? Mm. How, how similar is the, is the Russian system? Is it more like a Colorado Springs type deal? One for Dagestan, one for Osatia, or is it more like an RTC thing? more of an RTC things. They have clubs and things in different regions. Mm. But then what's crazy about that RTC thing is it's like, you have the RTC made up, but well, I guess it's kind of of like multiple teams. Like, like, great. They all are from Russia, but some are going to wrestle for, you know, some are wrestling for this country, some are wrestling for that country, some are wrestling for Russia. And then they do a thing, a better job of bringing them all together and getting them together. But the biggest difference is the RTC, the RTCs right now, it's like, Hey, you go hire your coach. You have your individual system. Where in Russia, it's like, hey, this is our Russia training system, and this is how you run it. So when I go to the RTC practice in Ohio State versus uh, Michigan, right, versus Arizona State versus wherever, they're all going to be differently structured and ran. Or you can go to Dagestan and train. You can go to Vladikovsky and train. You can go to uh, Moscow and train, Osatia and train. And all their wrestling structures are going to be the same. Now they're just interchanging exactly what it is they're doing for what they're not doing so i have a great uh breakdown of what that is and what that looks like and that was my qualm again right there's not two wrestling two youth wrestling clubs that have the same system it's like okay youth wrestling is going to start it well who's the youth wrestling coach thank god we have things like uh overtime school of wrestling thank god we have things um you know like young guns and, and good wrestling clubs that are coming up now 
but a majority, 80% of your youth wrestling coaches and youth wrestling programs out there are like, all right, wait, we have a bunch of kids that want to wrestle. Hey, is there any dads that have ever wrestled before? And four guys' hands will go up and they're like, I wrestled five years. I wrestled seven years. I wrestled eight years and haven't wrestled any of that. Great. Go teach the kids. Mm -hmm. No system, no training. And I think USA Wrestling is doing a better job of getting tools, but there's no way to really enforce it. In no. Russia, they're like, you're doing it this way and that's it. And that's the way we do things. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Um, obviously, we know which system works more consistently. Now, Team USA has never been better than it is right now. And thank God yeah. for it because we love watching them. Um, and just kind of wind this down. I know we've talked a little bit about life, personal development. To finish up with current events wrestling, I know you still follow the sport super closely. What are some matchups you'd like to see now that the Worlds are canceled? For us, at least. Oh, well, there's so I had that idea before. I was talking to like Dake in like 2016 because again, right? He Jaden Cox beat me out as a number one seed. I think Dake was the two seed. Uh, I was like, Kyle, if we're gonna do training and this is awesome, how about this? Let's wrestle. Let's wrestle a best two out of three series and film it ourselves, and then only give access to people that want to watch that match for like five bucks a view. Yep. But like, that's where you can use something like rope fin right now. Like I know uh, what Burroughs is like, Hey, my December's clear. Let's now Russell Taylor. Let's get at it and go. Well, great. And they're going to get this platform. So hopefully they can get a bigger payout. But that'd be like my question for Dake and Taylor right now is, or sorry, Taylor and uh, Jordan right now is why don't you guys film it, do it on your own and then charge to see who doesn't split the revenue down the middle and just at least see what it is they're going to do. Cause you're just going to do it to get a match ready. But they're also like, hey, maybe there'll be some big sponsors that'll come out and write me a $20,000 or $40,000 check to do one match that I would do anyways. So I think that's really interesting. And I'd love to see somebody take initiative and do that and see what that would generate, right? Mm -hmm. What are those, some of those matchups? I mean, I, I lo would love to see the uh, Kyle Schneider, right? Bo Nickel would be a great matchup. Bo Nickel and um, David Taylor would be a great one. Obviously, Dake and Burroughs right is awesome yanni is freaking fantastic right watching him and zane russell that that could go i mean people could watch, watch that all day um i love watching that. michik russell too yes yeah, michik's Deal. amazing yes i want to see miles and mean go at um you know go at david taylor because that's yep. the guy to take out right now and miles is just getting better and better right um i mean i mean i i have a connection with those people at the cliff keen wrestling club that's why i sure. love seeing them wrestle uh, and compete. So there's a ton of those great matchups going up. So yeah, I hope it continues to happen and it's great, but yeah, I'm not going to say I'm not disappointed that, you know, USA is not going to wrestle in December. At the World Super Day. disappointed. I think it's, it's a, a whole, a whole nother topic, but extremely disappointing. Um, we'll wind down with three questions. First is you are a personal development coach. You can call it whatever you want. We've talked about it before. You've helped me a lot. You're helping a ton of people. How does someone get in touch with Jake Herbert if they want to work with you in that kind of capacity? You shoot me an email, right? Email is the best way, or you find me on a text message. You can find my phone number. It's not hard to find out. I have it here. Um, Coach Herbert at kw.com. Or um, you shoot me a text number, 724-816-5369. Uh, get a hold of me, right? I do consultations. They're free of charge. I usually work with my clients for about a week or two. Uh, before I collect any payments so they can make sure that it is what they want, uh, that it isn't because I want to work with long-term people. So high level people that want to achieve their, their goals or who feel like they're not really getting what they need out of life, right? It's, it's, it's really tough because when we graduate from wrestling or you graduate from college, you leave that team behind, man, now we're independent because it's a lot easier to go to lift when we know, Hey, my roommates get me to lift. My team will be there. If I don't show up, my coach won't be there. Like now it's tough. You have mm -hmm. kids, you have wife, you don't have that reason to go there. So you need that accountability of that little push to do it. And when you hire somebody or put somebody in place to do that, that's, that's fantastic. The same reason why I, I've hired, like a, I, I'm literally in the process of hiring like another health coach, not because I don't know how to do it, but because I need somebody to hold me accountable to do it. Yeah. And if I'm paying somebody, guess what? It's now like a hundred hundred percent more chance and I'm more likely to actually do it um, for it. So yeah, to get a hold of me, just shoot me an email, coachherbert at kw.com. I have a webpage, jakeherbert.com, that talks more about it. Uh, I, I coach realtors, I coach business owners, I coach college students, I coach rock stars, I help people lose weight. Uh, it, it's anybody that really wants to get better. Uh, that's who I want to work with, and that's what I want to help, and that's what I want to continue to do. Love it. Second to last question, books. I know you're a well-read man. Give me a couple of books you're loving right now, Mr. Herbert. Oh, my gosh. So... I just finished um, 
what was the one? Uh, the Road Less Stupid. That was a fantastic breakdown. That's a, that's so Rich Dad, Poor Dad was a book that changed my life. If you have not read that, you must read that book. That book like changed my life about investing and everything else. And The Road Less Stupid is the author is who Rich Dad was ba- based off of. Mm. Uh, so that was one of my favorites. I, I, I love that one. Extreme Ownership is one by Jocko Wilkins that I would say that everybody in the world should read or would have to read. Um, I just finished one, The Defining Decade. That was awesome by Meg Joy. And that's talking about like what people do in their 20s because it's co- coaching related. Tell me about um, that one. I saw you posted that. What, what, yeah. what is that about? So it's a clinical psychologist and uh, Meg Joy is her name. And she basically interviewed, you know, was paid to be a clinical psychologist for kids in their 20s. And they're struggling with, well, what do I do for work? Or what do I do for marriage? Or what's going on here? I hear 30s is the new 20, or 20s is the new 30s or 40s and whatever. But she just has like I've heard all these issues of hours and hours and hours and hours of listening and consulting and kind of condense all her data of what worked well. What were the people who were feeling successful and succeeding in their 20s? What were they doing work wise? What were they doing health wise? What were they doing relationship wise? What were the questions that they were asking and answering and doing? Uh, that's a, that was a huge one that I loved. And the other one I just did was Die with Zero. Mm. That one was awesome because it literally just changed my mindset on and die with zero they're talking about like dying with money so it's 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 money related uh and it was like fantastic the way to like think about experiences versus money versus what you're going to leave behind versus how you're going to do it um and it got me thinking about things differently so the the biggest change that that book had on me is i'm going to leave a butt ton of money to my kids right my kids are going to have an awesome inheritance Mm -hmm. the issue is is my kids are not going to need that inheritance by the time that they're there. Like I still have my mom and dad uh, and I, I always want to have my mom and dad. I never want to get an inheritance from them because that means I don't have them anymore. I treasure my, my time more with them. And with that being said, the way that my wife and I are doing right now, if we got an inheritance of uh, whatever, it's called a million dollars. Great. Doesn't change my life. Right isn't going to change what it is I'm going to do. I'm already past that point. Now you give that to me at 25. Great. Makes it a heck of a lot easier to say, great. I know what I'm doing. We're living off of $24,000 a year with like a little paycheck and just out of college. Like I needed that, that money would have impacted me more then than it does now than versus let's say my parents pass away and I'm 60 years old. Well, I don't even need that money then. Right. And it was kind of like cool watching a thing. Cause I was watching, um, you know, my, my wife's grandfather just passed away and his inheritance will go to his parents, but or to his kids. Whereas like not, all his kids are in their sixties, they're mm-hmm. essentially financially retired. So the money's not going to do anything at that point. So there's a great story in there. That's talking about a lady that like, she had three kids, got divorced, um, and was literally li- like working two jobs, living on the brink of poverty. And then like, and it was like so hard and her parents had a little money would help her out. But then when her parents passed away, like 10 years later, she was already remarried, had a new job, was stabled and, and the, the $350,000 that she inherited did like nothing to change her life. Hmm. That money would have been so much better use at that time. So bringing me back to my point, what I'm going to do for my kids is they're going to have an opportunity to get their inheritance early, right? And the way that they're going to get, and they're going to earn this inheritance is right. They're going to have to read books and have conversations with people. So again, right, I have a lot of people that I respect and I met in my lifetime and I've been starting to have this now. So when my son turns 22 or 20 or whatever the age it is, great, if he wants to earn $10,000 during the summer, here's a list of 10 books that you have to read. And here's a list of 10 people that you got to sit down with, right? And then have a conversation. And then that person is going to say, yes, you understand the book and the concepts in it. I'm going to release it and you can get your $1,000 for this book or this task or no, you don't. I love it. Yeah, I I just, I just feel that's going to be so much more valuable for them because they're going to need that a lot earlier. Because if you do it right as a parent and an adult, by the time they're in their 30s or 40s, they don't need your money anymore, right? They just need your attention, your love, and your value. So I I think that die with zero was that had a huge change on what I'm I'm doing with my money and what I'm using it for, right? Uh, Experience versus right lifestyle. Well, it's an interesting topic because the word inheritance to me can be very, very scary. And you think about kids who are getting, you know, it takes away the the will. I mean, joy in life comes from the struggle, you know, and and to have that fear and 
you know, I know your dad is a, you know, a lane developer, but from what I hear, he wasn't super well off when you were growing up. And no. so do you get nervous about giving you know, the, the term inheritance for your kids? I mean, the, go ahead. Well, that, that's why they're not guaranteed it, right? Yeah. That's why there's going to be people in place that have put their character in and, and judge it and, and being able to say, hey, they can get X amount at this certain point in time. I don't want them to think they're going to get, again, they're not going to get anything unless they've proved it through their character. And I have somebody else, a board of directors that can say, yes, you actually are past this because of the actions that you're doing in life. Not just putting up a show, right? Oh, I look at this guy's social media. He looks like such a good person. Of course he does, right? No, you're getting in, you're having good in-depth conversations mm -hmm. and you're really being hit in point. Like where it's going to be a process of how to get this down and be, you're going to be judged by a board if, you, if, if you're willing and able to handle it or if you're only willing to handle a certain amount of it or not, because that's the worst thing, right? I do not want to have an entitled kid, uh, nor do I want to be like somebody who is entitled, right? I've had to work super hard for what I'm at physically, emotionally and everything. And I, I've been super blessed to have both parents who are still together, who are loving, who have supported me. And I'm going to do the same thing for my kids. But again, it's coming down to, you know, uh, healthy, uh, happy and productive, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's the basis of what I want my kids to be and to do, right? Is what they're doing. Is it healthy for them? Does it make them happy? And is it productive? Right. And I don't care what that is. Right. If you, you throw out something like baton twirling, if my son wants to be the best baton twirler in the entire world and it's, it's a healthy form because he's out there interacting with friends, uh, it makes him happy. He's super passionate about it, coming home and watching baton twirling videos and going and studying it and taking courses. And he's setting out to be the best in the world at it. And it's productive use of his time. Great. Right. I'm going to go and support that because that's something that's passionate for him. Yeah. Right? Or that he's super into and doing. Because that's all I want to do is support them to be world-class in what it is they want to do. If it's something like cigarette smoking, well, that doesn't check all the boxes, right? And it'll filter out 90-some percent, 95%. But that's why you have a board of directors. That's why you have people in place to guide and help your kids go along and, and, and see that stuff. Because it's not just me, right? My kids are listening to me now, but it'll be a lot of other people. So I love that book and that outcome on that for theories. And, and that's, that's what I want to do. And selfishly, Ryan, the way, the reason why I love coaching and helping other people too, it's not about the money. I tell them, here's how I know I'm successful, right? At one time when I can take and install you and your values and get you up at some point in time, you're going to be super successful and cool. And guess what? I'm going to want my son to sit down and spend a day with you. Right. To take you through and sit down and learn this out because right, he might think, oh, my God, Ryan, Ryan Warner is, is you know, that guy, dad, how do you know that guy? He, he runs and operates like the largest podcast of my, you know, he owns a whole media production company of podcast people. And I love listening to that. I can get in and do it. And I can go, hey, Ryan, great, man. We have a good relationship. Would you mind if my kid uh, bought you lunch and you sat down for a half an hour, an hour with him and you could pick your brain about things. Right. So you can complete that circle and give back. Uh, that's, that's really like the big thing that I find, uh, the most passionate joy about coaching. And it is the selfish reason as to why I help coaching people and want to bring other people up to level so that someday eventually it can go back and trickle down to maybe my kids or my friend's kids or somebody else and complete that circle of success and continue that upward mobility. Yes, indeed. Couldn't agree more. I'm signing up now for a book review for, for Mikey. Yeah. I'm going to want to put it in right now. Last thing, you're a coach of, of people now, but you also have an incredible wealth of knowledge of coaching wrestling. A lot of parents listen to this podcast who's, who are first-year wrestling parents, and they say, hey, I love hearing about all these backstories and learning the history of the sport. Give us one misconception now that you think most, most youth wrestling parents have about development or about success, and we'll sign off with that. Yeah. Winning doesn't matter at the, at the youth age, right? Like, Literally the first tournament that really matters competitively in your kid's life. And this depends on what their goal is going to be. And I believe if you're going to wrestle to the level, like your goal should be the best thing I can do is obtain a college scholarship with it. Well, literally then if that's your goal, my kid gets a college scholarship. The very first tournament that actually matters in his life is freshman year of States. Everything else before that is just learning. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. Right? How did Jordan Burroughs do in states at seventh grade? No idea. <laughs> no one knows. How did Kyle Dake do at states in sixth grade? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, no idea. No idea. What was Zane Rutherford doing as a fifth grader? Nobody knows. Nor do we care. Right? I, it, it doesn't matter up to that level. It's 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 the same thing. How was Kyle Schneider in as a um, you know, in middle school? It doesn't matter. Right? Is the kid having fun with it? Is he getting better? So this goes into our our growth mindset, right, that we do before our practice of base wrestling. 
the goal of every practice for your kids as a parent should be, did they learn one thing, right? Um, did they end the session better than they started? Did they help somebody else do the same? Meaning, did they help somebody learn or did they help somebody end better? And did they have fun doing it? So when your kid comes back from a practice or a competition, those are the conversations I'm going to be having rather than, right. And I had this conversation with my friend, Ty Morgan, who was a, a baseball player, right? He would come home and his dad would ask, Hey, how'd you do? Oh, I went three, I went, I went three for four batting. Well, what happened to that one that you didn't get on base? Now he's focused on results hmm. where if he would have came home and his dad would have said, Hey son, what'd you learn in tonight's game? Uh, I learned that I dropped my elbow a little bit when I swing and I go, okay, great. You learned something. How are you better now? Well, you know, afterwards, my coach and I did a couple swings, so I'm better now. Well, great. Did you help somebody else? Yeah, because I was doing it. So I taught the coach's kid and we, and we did that and I learned. Awesome. What was the most fun? Oh my God. My, my second hit, I smacked the thing out of the park and blah, 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 blah. And we ended up like winning the game. Right. Oh, and by the way, dad, I went like three for four, but like, I didn't even need to ask. It'll get that conversation going. It will come up, but it's getting kids to understand that it's the effort and the attitude and it's the journey not the outcome that mm -hmm. you should be really really focusing on so i will not call my kids smart i will never call my kids athletic i will never do do that and the reason being i know that they are smart they're going to be smart but i'm going to always praise the effort mm -hmm. when i ask my daughter right and you look at her thing and her doing her backflip on there I'm like oh tell me it's awesome how'd you get to do that well you weren't born able to do that she goes practice right hey what's the secret to getting better at that she goes you practice uh, everything else, right? They're going to come down to it and know that, hey, anything in life can be learned. It just takes practice. So for new parents, I would say one of the mandatory readings would be the talent code, mm. right? Read that book, the talent code, read the book, the art of learning. And those are the two ones that if you can take and mesh that together, that's kind of like how that started off the base journey. And that's what kind of would start these kids, you know, up and going in a great, in a great direction. So that's, that's a misconception is that winning doesn't mean crap at the youth level. It means absolutely nothing, oh, it, but it does, it, sorry, it means something to the kids too, because obviously if you're winning, it's a little bit more fun, but if a kid can handle and understand that like, Hey, the results, it's not the results. It's the effort. What I put in, you're going to have a better chance to have that kid have longer longevity and time in the sport. And I think have a more successful career. Jake Herbert, you are the man, sir. Every time I talk to you, I feel good. I'm excited. Thank you for your time, my friend. Yeah, right. Appreciate you, man. It wrestling changed my life. So I hope it continues to change yours and everybody else's out there. Indeed. We'll see you soon, Jake Herbert.